turn it over to Jane. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, I'm just so pleased that there are so many people with us tonight because we're in for a, a good time looking at some really incredible images together. So we'll just dive in. Thank you so much for the very nice introduction too. So, um, so over the, the course of the next hour or so, we'll be looking at uh, many of Edward Hopper's most famous works, some of his lesser known works, and exploring them in perhaps new and different ways too. So we've got sort of a classic Edward Hopper on the title screen here right now. It's called Summertime, it's from 1943. I think this is the kind of image that a lot of people associate with the name Edward Hopper, a solitary figure standing in the sunlight. There's some sort of mysterious element to it. Uh, and, and it sort of invites you to create your own story around it. Who is this woman? Um, what is this building she just emerged from? The open window sort of next to the door. What is she pondering as she stands in the sunlight? Who is she waiting for? So Edward Hopper offers up so much this way and, um, and we'll have a good time sort of diving into these. But I feel like it's important to note that Edward Hopper has a new relevance in our lives these days, doesn't he? Uh, I think uh, Right as COVID-19 hit, all of us were sort of thinking of, of deserted streets and empty theaters and that sort of thing. And then all of a sudden, his paintings have this, um, this new resonance in our lives. And I think that's important for us to sort of meditate on for a moment. But I also wanted to just share with you some of the things that Edward Hopper himself, the artist, lived through during his nice long life because he lived through a pandemic as well, which is sort of interesting for us to think about. So um, he turned 18 years old at the turn of the century. So when it turned 1900, and, um, and we all know that there's always some sort of like glo global tension whenever there's a new century. He was in his thirties at the start of World War I and through the 1918 flu. He married in the 1920s when he himself was already in his 40s, and he was middle-aged through the Great Depression. Uh, by the time America entered World War II, Edward Hopper was in his 60s, and he died at the age of 84 during the Cultural Revolutions of the 1960s. So what a life, what an incredible amount of, of um, upheaval he lived through. And, and I think it's good for us to keep all of that in mind as we're thinking of these images. So um, in particular, the idea that, that the world was changing and that things were sort of frightening, but he could create these images that still, I mean, to this day resonate with all of us, right? All right, so, so let's talk a little bit more about sunlight and solitude before we dive into the program overview and look at how we'll, how we'll navigate the next hour together. So I think these are, these are a few more sort of iconic Edward Hopper images. These are the kinds of images that we think of when we hear the artist's name. Solitary figures, in this case, we're seeing two women from behind. Um, we're sort of disconnected from them. They're not aware of our presence viewing them. This is New York interior from 1921 on the left. It's at the Whitney Museum. And then room in Brooklyn from 1932 on the right, which is at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. So one word that gets overused every single time people talk about Edward Hopper is of course the word loneliness. <laughs> and it's, it's so hard to dance around this word because it seems so relevant, but I'm gonna try my best not to overuse it. If you have a drink with you tonight, feel free to take a drink every time I say lonely. <laughs> but Edward Hopper himself even said, the loneliness thing is overdone. I think it's it's upon us to think of these different ways, but this is just this is our slide to sort of think about this idea of being alone and what he's really capturing because it's a powerful thing and it's a thing that we don't talk about a lot as human beings. So Olivia Lang, who wrote the, the Lonely City, she recently wrote in the New York Times, loneliness is a taboo state in our social world. And part of its extraordinary pain has to do with shame. So we never really talk about feeling lonely, maybe more so, maybe we do more so in, in the age of COVID-19. 
But Edward Hopper's paintings in, in touching upon this and capturing it, tap into something that we all feel and that we don't express or communicate very well. So there's a power there. And he does it not just with figures, but sometimes with places too. This is his painting called Early Sunday Morning from 1930. This is also at the Whitney Museum. And this is a depiction of Seventh Avenue, right on the cusp of the depression. And, um, and we see these long shadows as the day is just beginning. We see sort of uh, signs of life, you know, with the curtains drawn and the barbershop pole, pole and that sort of thing, but no people here occupying the space. And there's a sense of solitude here that can be very powerful. And one little element that he includes here, which always changes this painting for me every time I really think about it, because this is a long, low brick building. But then he's included just behind it, the suggestion of a skyscraper. He does it by just putting a black square there at the top right. And it becomes this sort of looming presence, a sense of dread in this case. And, and so it changes the picture dramatically. And, um, and somehow we know we're not in Nebraska, we're in New York City, but, but there's, something, there's something else happening here. So one last note on, on sunlight and solitude, this, this bigger idea is um, I, I wanted to hit home with this picture in particular, which is called uh, Morning Sun. This is from 1952 and it's at the Columbus Museum of Art. And so here we see again, a solitary female figure. She's in an apartment. She's looking, she's gazing at this huge window here. And, um, and, and she seems to be lost in thought, seems to be unaware of our presence. And because she sort of turned away from us, uh, her, her I face and we would speak so I can hear it. Possible. But what uh, Edward Hopper has done here. Oh, if it goes. Okay. This uh, sort of parallelogram of bright light behind her. And it almost functions like a comic book in some ways, where it's like a thought bubble. It's almost inviting us into her interior space to uh, put ourselves in her place and to do some perspective taking. You know, what, what would she be thinking or feeling as she's sitting on this bed in this warm sunlight all by herself? So, uh, so uh, many different ways to kind of enter these paintings and to consider them, but let's get going with the actual program itself. So we've talked a little bit about social distancing, sunlight and solitude. I wanted to introduce you to the artist. This is him in a self-portrait from 1930. And, um, and so we'll talk a little bit about his biography. We'll talk about his travels in Paris, his early work in New York City. We'll talk about the tremendous influence of his wife, Josephine, uh, their travels to the Cape Cod. And then the last few sections are really the sections I'm most excited about. So I wanted to kind of move quickly towards them. Uh, Edward Hopper's work and its connection to film noir. And then thinking about Edward Hopper sort of beyond the category of realism. So he's usually always, um, uh, placed squarely in the category of, of American realism. And for the most part, art historians don't really think about how his work is, is interacting or was interacting with other work at the same time, particularly uh, the more avant-garde work that was being produced. So we'll, we'll dive into that. And so I'll move through the rest of the material somewhat quickly so we can spend some time there. So Edward Hopper, <clears throat> introduction and bio, <laughs> Edward Hopper was born just north of New York City in a town named Nyack. You can see it's up here where the pin has dropped. And, um, and it, once you're ready to start, stop socially distancing <laughs> and ready to go on a little trip, his childhood home, which you see on the right, is now the Edward Hopper House Museum and Study Center. And I think they have a lot of his early work and sort of ephemera there, which might be really interested, in, interesting to look at. So he, he uh, was born to you know, a very comfortable middle-class existence. This is him and his sister over here on the left. Uh, and his sister's name is Marion. He looks like a very young boy here. And he was probably only about nine years old when he first, when he drew this picture that's on the right. Supposedly he drew it on the back of a report card. I don't know when the signature was added, <laughs> but I think we all know um, 
that he's always had this kind of attraction to the sea. So I think it's really interesting that one of these early works is, is, a, is a young boy on the edge of the water like this. So from a young age, actually from the age of five, he really showed a strong interest in the arts. And so that, that same house museum oftentimes puts on exhibitions that feature some of his earliest work. Uh, the work on the left is his first signed and dated work. And even though it's unextraordinary to the average person, it does show an early interest in light and shadow, of course. And then I love this drawing of the skeleton of a sparrow over here on the right, because not only is it done on, you know, lined notebook paper, which tells us he was still a very young boy when he did it, but it's an incredible amount of detail. Um, even the, the penmanship sort of indicates that he was still very young when he did it. And I, and I wanted to include it because it's important in the way Edward Hopper talks about his work that he, for him, the drawing is, is the connection to reality. And the painting is the extrapolation that involves the imagination and involves creativity and sort of takes it away a little bit from realism. So we can see that his drawings were very much wedded to reality. All right, so here we see Edward Hopper as a young man. This is him over here on the right. And he is working as a part-time illustrator for um, a, a, a company called C.C. Phillips Agency. And they were basically doing trade magazines. So he was, you know, creating images for the covers of trade magazines and some other popular magazines. Do you see how happy he looks in this picture? This is about as happy as he was doing this work. It wasn't really satisfying to him, but his parents thought that this would be a good way for um, an artist to earn a steady paycheck. And he had actually gone to, he had attended a correspondence school for illustration for about a year. So um, managed, to, managed to make a career out of it. And here's just a few examples of his work early on. And, and whenever you look at early work, it's always kind of exciting because you can oftentimes see the seed of what, what is to come. So even though you wouldn't necessarily pick these, you know, off the wall as an Ed, as Edward Hopper pieces, we see, you know, sort of an interest in theater over here on the left, um, an interest in sort of quiet uh, figures and dining outside, which we'll see a lot of when he goes to Paris over here on the right. And I believe both of these works are at the Whitney Museum. A lot of his collection is there. So, so we see a, a little bit of that, but uh, I, I should emphasize that working as a, an illustrator was not something that he really enjoyed. Apparently having a deadline was um, was really sort of torturous to him. It wasn't uh, any, anything that, that helped him to function well or helped him to produce any sort of creative work. So he, he felt very much stifled under it, but he worked as a commercial illustrator for, uh, I wanna say almost two decades um, here and there. Uh, but shortly after attending the correspondence school <laughs> for illustration, he transferred to the New York School of Art and Design, which is sort of the forerunner to what is today Parsons. And he began to study under the artist that we see here on the left, a man by the name of Robert Henry. And Henry was the leader of, or a, you know, a main player in what's known as the Ashcan School of Art. This is an example of his work on the right. It's called um, Snow in New York from 1902. And it was an American movement of art that focused on the sort of in, invigorating energy of city life. And they painted, they painted cities kind of warts and all, which is how you get this, this name Ashcan School. It kind of refers to painting um, uh, like literally like cigarette butts and, and trash and garbage and that sort of thing. But, um, but, but Robert Henry, in addition to being this leader in American modern painting, he was a great teacher and he was teaching other, leading, uh, other artists who end up being leading American artists like um, George Bellows and Rockwell Kent. And so Edward Hopper is a part of this really kind of exciting group of up and coming artists. And he learns a great deal from Robert Henry. Robert Henry isn't prescribing a certain way of painting, but 
Edward Hopper's earliest work, the work that he was accomplishing at that time, sort of reflects the same spirit. This is another self-portrait from 1906 on the right and a painting of a model sitting from 1902. So he's using kind of these, these darker tonalities. Um, he's using kind of loose brush strokes and he's kind of achieving a similar look to what uh, Henry was, was kind of working with. Now to sort of round out Edward Hopper's early career. We've got another, or his career in general, I should say. We've got another self-portrait. This is a, a much later one from 1945, also at the, at the Whitney. And then um, a painting called The Bootleggers from 1925. And this is in my hometown art museum at the Courier Museum of Art. And to sort of round out this kind of early part of of um, the program and thinking about Edward Hopper in general, this is this is sort of the spot where we pause and think about, okay, well, he's the leading American realist for the 20th century, but what does that really mean and how does that reflect in his paintings? And I want to say, when you look at an image like the bootleggers, we can see this, he's very much wedded to recording the, the, the um, the intricate details of this architecture, of this mansard roof, of this kind of Victorian style house, he paints it as though he's painting the face of a portrait. But there's so much about the rest of this picture that is painted in such an ambiguous way, whether it's, you know, sort of the suggestion of, I don't know, trees in the background, uh, a fog bank that just sort of curves off the edge over here, um, the way he uh, delineates this difference of, of um, land and sea, even the sea itself. Uh, I bring in this picture because it is so, it, it really just isn't a realistic picture in many ways. The house looks great, but the rest of it is, is um, seemingly um, abstracted in a lot of interesting ways. And, and of course, again, we get um, all of the mystery of, of what's happening between all of these figures. So Edward Hopper ends up painting about 360 major paintings throughout the course of his, of his career. And it's a long career. I would say that's a relatively small number of paintings for how many years he worked. So again, this idea of working under a deadline never suited him well. Sometimes he would just go to the movies for like weeks at a time instead of working because he sort of had this sense of paralysis. And even his friends and, and other um, artists sort of talked about, you know, I wish he could just be a happier person. I wish, I wish that he could just, you know, pick up a brush and go with it because, because he was sort of frozen sometimes. So let's talk about him moving a little bit. So he, uh, in addition to working as an illustrator, he spent uh, a fairly significant amount of time in Paris in this formative part of his career, um, particularly in um, around 1906, 1908. He, I believe he did three trips to Europe and each of those trips really centered around a long period in Paris. And he wasn't engaged in any sort of formal education while he was there. He wasn't studying under anybody. He just spent a lot of time at the cafes. He was living the life we all want to lead, right? <laughs> so he would dash off these great pictures of other people at the cafes, interesting people, sometimes prostitutes, um, but people who are just, you know, living that Parisian lifestyle out at the cafes, drinking outdoors, talking outdoors, capturing these moments of places and places where we would all want to be, you know, sitting by the Seine with a bottle of wine. Now, while he was there, he was certainly exposed to other artists and other artistic movements. And um, the best we can glean really is that he was really impressed with the, what the Impressionists um, were bringing to the art scene even um, after the turn of the century. So Impressionism certainly um, came to came to be and uh, sort of rose in the estimation of, of the French public decades earlier, but it, it still sort of lingered. So the image that you see here on the left is uh, what I would call sort of a typical Impressionist painting. It's by the artist Camille Pissarro, dates to 1903. And of course, it shows a bridge in Paris. And on the right, we see Edward Hopper's sort of take on the same subject. 
And uh, right off the bat, you can probably see that his brushwork is not as loose and as broken as an impressionist. Uh, the impressionists here are not trying to create the illusion of a photograph or a window onto another world. They want you to see the individual dabs of paint. And Edward Hopper is his his the application of his paint is much smoother, but it's still sort of broken and fragmented enough that we know that um, that it's paint on a canvas and, and not a photograph or, or a window onto another world. His his colors are still fairly dark though here. Uh, he had been very impressed by Rembrandt when he had traveled in in Europe, and of course he still has these lessons of Robert Henry echoing around in his brain. So the Impressionists, as I said, make an impression on him. And even by the 1960s, really the only sort of group or, um, or, or really sort of teaching that he gives credit to, he, he says, I think I'm still an Impressionist. So he sort of considered um, himself a, a disciple of, of this style of painting. And after he returns home to New York, after all of these travels, he creates this image a few years later. It's called Soie Bleu. So it even has a French name and it's from 1914 and it's at the collection of the Whitney Museum. This is such a strange painting and it's not your typical Edward Hopper painting in many ways. It has that blue background, which always, the blue always reminds me of Edward Hopper, but everything else here is strange. Edward Hopper, typically speaking, does not create crowded scenes, <laughs> bustling scenes of people interacting like this. And we've got a real strange cast of characters here, um, noticeably a clown, <laughs> which is really a French subject here, um, maybe a lady of the evening, um, some, some men over here, this almost looks like it could be Van Gogh behind the pole, but um, a, a real sort of interesting cast of characters, people mixing about as they're sitting at these little cafe tables. And then, you know, the interesting element here too of the painting sort of being divided um, by this column or beam. And that element in particular really reminds me and many other art historians of, of what the Impressionists were doing. People like Edgar Degas decades earlier, fragmenting their pictures with these architectural elements that provide a great deal of visual interest as you're documenting what life was like in, um, in the Paris cafes and at these bars at nighttime. So even after Edward Hopper returns home, he's still sort of ruminating on these lessons from the Impressionists. And even decades later, I would argue that, um, that the Impressionists were still sort of rattling around in his, in his brain. On the, on the left, we've got a famous Impressionist painting by Claude Monet, sort of, you know, the granddaddy, granddaddy of all Impressionists. This is his um, San Giorgio Maggiore at dusk from 1912. And Edward Hopper's painting on the right is from 1929, so significantly later. But of course, in both of these pictures, we have these unbelievable sunsets that have painted a rainbow of colors across the sky. And then we have a structure that is sort of silhouetted against it. And of course, Monet's using this you know, this famous church in Venice, and, and, that, and, and that's beautiful and, 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 and incredible. And, and Edward Hopper, you know, sort of true to being an American artist, uses a railroad tower <laughs> to silhouette against this incredible sky. Um, we see, again, the, the Impressionists always have these more active, animated, vibrant brushstrokes, but we see a little bit of it still in Edward Hopper's blue sky up here. So there's always a relationship. And of course, whenever I show this Monet piece, I can't help but reference the um, Thomas Crown Affair, because if you've ever seen the movie with Pierce Brosnan, that's the picture he steals. So now you know, it's a Monet. Um, but the most important thing about Edward Hopper in Paris is that he was there when some of the most exciting things were happening in the art world. Namely, you have Picasso and Brock who are basically developing cubism, you know, the most monumental um, art movement of the 20th century. And you know what, Edward Hopper said he didn't even hear of him while he was there. So works like this um, didn't really sort of 
either interest him or he didn't come, uh, uh, cross paths with them. So Edward Hopper comes back to New York <laughs> and, um, and that's 1910. And from that point forward, he never leaves the country again. Uh, but modernism does follow him back. And just a few years later, there's this huge show called the Armory Exhibit, and that's right in New York City. And, and it's still famous and still talked about today because uh, you have so many European modernists who were exhibiting work at that show. And the work was groundbreaking. It was avant-garde. It was pictures of the world it, it, that... Um, it was a way to picture the world <laughs> that, that nobody had ever really considered before. And the image on the right just gives you a little bit of a snapshot into that. So you have people like Matisse and Duchamp and, uh, and all that, and they were just, they, they blew everybody's mind. But of course there were galleries upon galleries of more traditional artwork there that did not get the same amount of notice. Um, Edward Hopper himself also exhibited at the Armory Show, and it was this painting, Sailing, that from 1911, and he actually sold it. It, it sold for $250, which I think was one of his first oil paintings ever to sell. So that seems like a good start to a painting career, but unfortunately, throughout the 19-teens, living in New York City, Edward Hopper is just not successful. He cannot get traction with his work. And so the work that does sell are his prints um, and etching like this one. This is called Night on the L Train from 1918. And what we see here are two sort of shadowy figures on the inside of a train car. And because it's the L train, that means it's the elevated train. So we can see that they are just above a building here. And, um, and looking, and, and this woman in particular has turned away from the inside of, of the train car. And she's looking at um, the city skyline just across from her. So, so this is the kind of, of image that, that he could sell. And, and even when he starts getting some small solo exhibitions, he wasn't even selling his work. So it really took a long time before he, um, before he could gain some traction. But the prints were doing well. And the prints sort of led him to this. Um, this idea of kind of looking out of the elevated train and glimpsing people's lives. And this is, these are the kinds of paintings that Edward Hopper started producing in New York City um, around the 1920s. So uh, the work on the left is called Apartment Houses from 1923. The work on the right is called Night Windows from 1928. And for both of these pictures, you have the sense that you're sort of up above and kind of looking down and into these apartment buildings. And Edward Hopper gives us these incredible little slices of life here where, um, where we see these figures who are kind of bent over in action. In some cases, we're looking right through apartments. And, um, and he's inviting us again to sort of create a story about them as you would if you were on the train watching, uh, you know, just looking out the window and seeing these little snippets of people's lives. So, um, so he's also showing us what life looks like when it's, when you're living in a city and it's all congested like this and people are so it's, it's sort of tightly packed. I mean, this was, this was an, a, a new way of living still in the United States. So in addition to just, you know, these, these little vignettes that, that you can imagine were inspired by traveling around on the elevated train, he gives us scenes like this one. And this is called New York Restaurant from 1922. And even looking at this now in the age of, of COVID-19, you know, I'm thinking about a crowded restaurant and, um, and how unusual that must have been even for him at coming off of the Spanish flu. So, um, you know, surviving the Spanish flu, not to say that he had it, but to see a crowded scene like this must have been, you know, a change in, 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 in society and in culture. And I wanted to share this image with you because I think it, it gives us some insight into how he works because it's another sort of unusual scene for him in that it's a crowded scene. But it's, to me, all about shapes and forms, the repetition of shapes and forms. So we have these kind of curved chairs in the foreground. And those curves are um, repeated again 
in the shapes and the and, and the forms of, of figures in their shoulders or their backsides. We've got um, a waitress here who's bussing a table and and I was staring at this giant bow on her back and just sort of wondering about it. And then I see how it's kind of balanced out by this kind of unusual plant that's growing up in the window here. And, and that plant's uh, big blue uh, vase down here seems to be sort of balanced out by, by this stylish red hat that the woman at the center is wearing. So Edward Hopper is really concerned about the repetition of shapes and forms, sort of balancing out these, these kind of chaotic uh, paintings like this, but, um, but also creating a snapshot into, into a world with these kind of unresolved storylines. So there's a lot going on in these pictures, but let's talk about one of his most famous and probably one of my most beloved images of his, which is called The Automat from 1927. And this picture is just so striking to me because what we're seeing is a solitary figure who's eating at a restaurant where, um, where all the food is, is purchased from vending machines. She doesn't interact with anyone to be there, but she is there in what seems like the darkest of nights. <laughs> She's sitting in front of this giant plate glass window and we don't see anything outside beyond the window, but we do see the reflection of these electric lights over her head, which seem to draw our eye right to her. And then this sort of inky mass of black that, that forms this pyramid around her. And then it draws our eye down to her and, and this hat almost perform, uh, uh, creates this kind of protective element around her, brings our eyes down to her shoulders and her hands. There's one glove on a hand and one hand that's ungloved. Makes you think about, is she, is she getting ready to leave? Did she never even take off the other glove? She's already got one plate that's empty, um, but she almost seems as though she's seeking protection from being viewed from other people. It's, um, it's really, uh, such a striking image of, of a solitary woman. And of course, art historians over time have sort of speculated, you know, who she is. Is she a lady of the night? That sort of thing. Um, but I always wonder, was she there to meet someone? Has she been stood up? Has her friend or her date already left? Why are they out in the middle of the night? But again, there's all these beautiful kind of formal choices that Edward Hopper made from you know, the complimenting fruit bowl here that adds this splash of color right at the center to all these like little gold um, highlights that, that accent or play off of, of her hat here. It's just a beautiful picture. So we have a solitary figure in a restaurant. We also have this really striking, gorgeous woman at a movie theater and Edward Hopper loved movie theaters. This is called New York Movie, it's from 1939. So more than a decade after the automat. And what he's presenting to us here is the usherette at the theater who, um, to, to Edward Hopper's eye is more interesting than the movie itself. We just get a little bit of the silver screen over here, a mostly empty theater, but the usherette is um, you know, showered in this golden light and she even stands in front of these red curtains as though, she, as though it's like her own personal stage over here. And, uh, and she's lost in thought and she's unaware of us, the viewer staring at her. So, um, so it, it it's a fascinating image because I, I mean it's it's all about sort of being being a, an observer of a modern life, being a, a voyeur too, and and sort of speculating about what somebody might be lost in thought about. Some art historians connect this again to the impressionists and um, and works like the one on the left here by by. Um, by Manet, the bar at the Folie Bergère from the early 1880s, where we see another woman who's sort of in a working class position, who, whose gaze is unfocused and who seems again, sort of lost in thought, maybe imagining a different kind of life for herself as she's being approached by a, a gentleman who's uh, there to order a, a, a drink at the bar. I also connected to other work that was being produced around the same time. Believe it or not, I would say, that Norman Rockwell was influenced by Edward Hopper here because just a few years after New York movie was painted, Rockwell painted the Hat Check Girl from 1941. 
And it, to me, it's the same idea. It's, uh, you know, a young, beautiful woman lost in thought um, with this kind of, you know, dead end or kind of boring job. And you can just imagine that she's kind of dreaming of what her life could be like or, or what her life beyond this, this kind of simple job might be. So all of this brings us to the granddaddy of all of these um, incredible New York paintings, and that is the Nighthawks. And I have a special affinity for this painting, so bear with me. This is from 1942. It's one of the most recognizable paintings in all of American art. And, um, and it's just, it's, it's absolutely iconic. So before we dive into looking at it, we just have to acknowledge like all the different ways it's been quoted and parodied over the years. Of course, we have the Boulevard of Bro Broken Dreams. I think this was my first exposure to um, the Nighthawks with like Marilyn Monroe and James Dean. This is from um, the 1980s. And then even today, there's so many parodies of this painting from The Simpsons to Star Wars to Corgis. <laughs> it's so interesting to me that there's something about this composition and the relationship of the characters that seems like it's a fitting way to tell a story about characters that we already know and love. There's something fascinating about that. So the Nighthawks is at the Chicago Art, the Art Institute of Chicago. It um, was purchased the same year that it was painted, and they purchased it for a mere $3,000, amazingly. Here we see it in the galleries. It's about five feet long by about three feet tall, just to give you a sense of scale. Now back into the image itself. Um, so what we're looking at here, of course, we are viewers out on a sidewalk. And we can surmise that it's probably the middle of the night because the sidewalks are empty. Most of the storefronts are dark, but we are in this broad swath of sidewalk as we're approaching this diner that wraps around a corner. I just love this rounded corner with the way he's painted the glass here. It almost makes it feel like an aquarium, right? <laughs> and sort of like a fish in an aquarium, we see these four figures in this brightly illuminated diner and we're drawn in as voyeurs, as viewers, imagining what, what they're doing out at this time of night, what their relationships are to each other. Is this a couple? Are they there together? And, um, and so, so there's that element of storytelling here. Now, Edward Hopper did tell his biographer, Gail Levin, that this picture was inspired by reading Ernest Hemingway's story, The Killers which is about um, some killers at a small town diner before they um, before they murder a, a, a prize fighter. <laughs> but but obviously that's sort of a, a loose inspiration here. So um, so let's dive in a little bit closer and we will co actually come back to this painting in a little while too. So what we see here, um, again, I think it's these ambiguous relationships that really draw people in because even the, the, the man and the woman here that I just referred to as being a couple, you could sort of make the case either way if they're there to, together. He's got a cigarette in his, in his hands and it looks like she might be holding a matchbook. Their hands aren't directly touching, but they're very close. And, um, and they're seated next to each other in a relatively empty diner, but there's still this, this space between them. He seems like he's more interested in sort of communicating with um, the boy working behind the, the, the counter here. And she seems kind of lost in thought. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of how Edward Hopper put this picture together, because he worked on it, I believe, over about a month and a half, and he essentially storyboarded it like it was um, like it was a movie. He started off with just the empty diner itself, and then he began to populate it. Interestingly enough, um, again, as COVID-19 broke out and people were thinking about empty spaces, you even have this tweet here of, you know, essentially the empty diner, <laughs> people thinking about the age of coronavirus. And that's, you know, and that's a stage in, in um, Edward Hopper's process. Over here, we have what is essentially the completed drawing. And if you remember, the drawing is fact for Edward Hopper. The, the drawing is resolved, and then the painting is the extrapolation. So we have a figure 
who's seated all the way from behind. We don't see anything of him here. We even have text on the glass. And Edward Hopper gives us a little bit of mystery by showing us his face and, um, and opening it up to all this ambiguity by taking away that text and just creating essentially a movie screen for us to watch as the drama unfolds in this, in this space. More of his drawings show just um, how detailed he was, how methodical. I love that he's like actually labeling the color of what a, would be inside a, a maple syrup container. <laughs> um, you also have those, those sort of like space age coffee carafes or, or um, coffee pots in the background that he sort of plotted out there. So he really planned every aspect of this picture. And then in the end, we get this beautiful painting that is so ambiguous and it really draws us in. So like I said, we'll be returning to this in, in, in sort of our final section, but I wanted to have this chance to introduce you. And I also wanted to introduce you to Edward Hopper's wife, who ooh, I should quickly say was the model for this redhead in Nighthawks too. So here she is, her name's Josephine Hopper. And, um, and this is a painting of her by Edward Hopper's painting teacher, um, Robert Henry. And the painting here is from about 1906. Jo Hopper was also a painter in her own right. You can see the paintbrushes in her hands here. And, and she and Edward Hopper were sort of, so they knew each other as students and then they are sort of reunited in their forties and they dated for a year and then they married. And they lived in a very spare fourth floor walk up in Washington Square Park. And after, uh, after they, they were married, she served as not only his model, virtually his own, one of his only models <laughs> for the next um, several decades. She also served as like a manager to him and, um, a, and an art historian and a negotiator. <laughs> this, the image on the right is one of the few paintings of her, um, a self-portrait by her uh, that dates to 1956. And the image on the left is a rare painting, a rare portrait of her by Edward Hopper. And that dates to 1936. So even though he was painting her all the time as his model, it was pretty unusual for him to paint her as um, in, in terms of a, of a portrait. And I think part of that is because they were uh, very <laughs> different personalities. So here we have a photograph of the two of them together. Um, and they bickered quite a bit. They fought quite a bit. She was like this small sort of outgoing bundle of energy. And he was this big lumbering sort of morose kind of man. <laughs> and so their marriage was filled with a great deal of strife. There was, um, there was definitely some, some physical violence uh, apparently on both ends. Um, apparently after the, they celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary, Joe suggested they both deserved a medal for distinguished combat. And one of the ways that they fought with each other was that Edward Hopper would draw these like mean little cartoons about her and leave them around the house. So the image that we have here um, is, is them fighting with their hands in each other's faces. And the caption is, he cannot choose but hear. So when you get into somebody's face, certainly, <laughs> a few more of these kind of vindictive cartoons from their, from their, from their um, marriage. This one is called Mealtime. <laughs> and of course, here he is um, feeling like he is not a very well-fed husband. <laughs> she often refused to cook. <laughs> And then here we have the sacrament of sex, the female version. So clearly he felt um, somewhat powerless in this relationship oftentimes, um, but it wasn't always bad. Joe Hopper encouraged him to work in different media. She pushed him to, to work in watercolors. And these are two watercolors that he painted of her. I guess you could qualify them as portraits again, but. Um, she is, uh, you know, seen from the back, there's an emotional remoteness here. So here she's painting in their Cape Cod house, and here she's painting in the car in Wyoming. And this is a good segue to Cape Cod, because um, Cape Cod uh, it plays such a huge role in, in Edward Hopper's career. So they began going in 1930, and then just a few years later, they decided to 
build a house in Truro right on the water. This is their house. He's sitting um, just in front of it. Joe is off in the distance. This is a little cartoon that he did about the house that Joe built. So of course he was, he was critical of how, of how it turned out. But uh, Cape Cod proves to be a uh, really fertile ground for him. And he paints over a hundred oil paintings and watercolors depicting the Cape over the next few decades. So let's take a look at a few of them. And just knowing that we're a little bit short on time, I might move through these a little bit quickly. So the image that we have here is called the Lee Shore. It's from 1941. And we have um, these beautiful sailboats on this, you know, stunning expanse of sea with just a, a few sort of whipped up white clouds in the background kind of echoing the shape of those sails. But in typical Edward Hopper fashion, he's giving us this kind of ambiguous relationship between the water, the land and the architecture. And this is what oftentimes pushes his pictures more into the realm of surrealism rather than just realism. You feel like that house is kind of hovering out over, over the water and that sailboat could have just sailed right into it. But the colors here are just gorgeous and they're so peaceful. But a lot of, oh, and I should mention here too, um, some of Edward Hopper's paintings uh, of the Cape are just images like this one that are, are not populated. And whenever I see this picture, I'm reminded of the Edward Hopper quote, that is, maybe I'm not very human. What I wanted to do was paint sunlight on the side of a house. And I think he really got to do that when he was in Cape Cod in particular. So this is Cornhill Truro that we're looking at here. Many of his Cape images look a lot like his New York City images in that, um, that we have these solitary figures that are sort of bathed in sunlight, um, but we still get the sense of kind of sadness as we look at them. This, this image, uh, which is called Cape Cod Morning, it, it's at the Smithsonian, it dates to 1950. It's so similar to that one that we started off with this evening, which it, uh, called Morning Sun from just two years later. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a different version of that same pink dress or pink slip. And, and it's the same woman essentially looking out a window and, um, and possibly contemplating, contemplating her day, contemplating her life, it's hard to say. And instead of um, having, you know, the sunlight on the wall, but behind her here in the Cape Cod picture, again, we can sort of see through the architecture. Interestingly enough, we know that, um, that Joe Hopper sort of uh, took notes and kind of annotated what a lot of these paintings were about. And sometimes she would you know, build these stories about these characters or what they were doing. And I think for this one in particular, he wrote, she wrote something to the effect of like, oh, she's planning her day um, as she's looking out the window, you know, thinking about the weather and planning her day. And Edward Hopper said, don't do that. Don't create a story. I'm not Norman Rockwell. That's not what this is about. He wanted to leave it ambiguous. And with an image like this, that's exactly what he achieves. We have Cape Cod Evening from 1939 here. This is at the National Gallery of Art. And I always think of this as a, a really, um, a really great example of how ambiguous his paintings could be. So we have uh, this what we could imagine is probably a couple here. Her arms are crossed as though she's upset. Um, he's not looking at her. They're in, they're uh, aside this, this beautiful architecture, this uh, lovely Victorian, but the landscape all around them is sort of unattended to. And then we've got this, this gorgeous collie dog who's almost right at the center of the picture, who seems to be alert and almost weary of something that's outside of the frame, something that the humans haven't even become aware of yet. So, so there's all this ambiguity between the, the living creatures here and even the relationship of, of sort of man-made structures to the natural world here. We know that uh, Edward Hopper would paint in his car and we know that sometimes he just, uh, he needed new scenery in order to gain a little inspiration. So a painting like this one that's called Rooms for Tourists at Yale University Art Gallery, this is from 1945. We know that he just got in his car and <laughs> drove around the Cape and then found a building that sort of interested him. And I think in, with this picture in particular, he was 
probably hoping to see, you know, a little vignette or a story unfolding with um, with figures. But but oftentimes when he painted Victorian architecture, that alone kind of served as as an interesting face for him. Without a doubt, I would say this is Edward Hopper's most famous Cape painting, which is called Rooms by the Sea. This is also at Yale, it's from 1951. And this is another really stunning picture where we have this totally ambiguous relationship between architecture and ocean. We have this open door where you feel like you could just walk right out or fall into the ocean. He actually had a subtitle for this picture, which he eventually sort of um, let go of the, and, and it was called the jumping off point and people attached a really sort of um, morbid sense to, to what that meant. So he said, let's just call it rooms by the sea. And so this is a picture, even though it is about the ocean, it's really about that sunlight spilling in too. And so we've got, you know, this, this kind of interesting shape of the sunlight. We've got this empty room here and um, and we've got, you know, all of the, the cool and, 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 and the warm of what it feels like to be on the Cape in the summertime, but then all of this strange sense of ambiguity where, again, we're sort of moving from realism to surrealism really quickly. And I just wanted to quickly connect that back to, again, even some of his earliest pictures, which um, show this kind of fondness for the ocean, even at a young age. This is actually another illustration that he did in um, 1906 that's called The Boy in the Moon. And we can see a young man who's waking up in his bed and the architecture around him is sort of crumbling and then um, almost dissolving out so that he has this beautiful access to the ocean and, and the, the moon setting or rising just beyond it. So, so certainly the ocean and, and the beach have been um, a, a steady point of interest for him throughout his career. So, all right, film noir. Now, Edward Hopper, as I mentioned, loved the movies. He would go and escape at the movies like so many of us do. And particularly when he was stuck in his work, he would go there and I think sometimes find inspiration, which is so perfect because there have been so many directors and actors since who have looked at his work for inspiration. And I bring in this term film noir because um, that's a, a, a great connection to his style of painting. Film noir is, is basically, um, you know, crime dramas from the 1940s and the 1950s. They're really heavy on style. And they're the kinds of things that you would see um, that sort of look like Edward Hopper's etching here, Night Shadows from 1921 where you're looking down at a figure, there's like these um, who's, you know, walking the streets at night by himself up to no good, <laughs> probably, but you know, these long shadows and a lot of mystery that goes along with it. But in particular, uh, Edward Hopper's work is oftentimes most compared to or most um, sort of correlated to the work of, of Alfred Hitchcock. So Hopper's iconic painting, um, House by the Railroad from 1925, which is at the MoMA, um, certainly served as inspiration for Hitchcock's house um, in the movie Psycho and subsequent however many <laughs> um, um, uh, sequels were made to that movie. So Edward Hopper's painting is, of course, like a portrait of this um, kind of uh, grim <laughs> depiction of this Victorian architecture, this kind of mysterious shadowy house here that's made even more forlorn by how it's kind of cut off from the world by this by these train tracks. And that is exactly what Alfred Hitchcock wanted to capture in his movies. In fact, he wanted this exact same perspective so much that even though budgets were short, he just built those two walls of that house in order to achieve that same view that Edward Hopper had captured in his painting decades earlier. We also have the idea of Edward Hopper as kind of a voyeur looking in, into, into people's rooms from the L train as he traveled around New York City. And that was certainly 
um, could have played an inspiration to Hitchcock with movies like Rear Window, where you have somebody who's kind of peeking out of their own apartment windows into the windows of, of, of neighbors nearby and kind of imagining what those relationships are that you can just glimpse through a window. The image uh, over here on the left by Edward Hopper is called Room in New York from 1932 where we see a couple and we don't really know what's going on between them. Are they fighting? Is this just the, you know, is this a typical evening for them? Um, but Edward Hopper is telling us that we are on the outside here. We've got the frame of the window. And that's certainly how things kind of play out in, in the wonderful movie, Rear Window too. You're on the outside and you're just, you're speculating uh, based on, on what you can see through, through those windows. You have other directors um, who directly quote Edward Hopper paintings. There, there's a 1981 film called Pennies from Heaven that stars Steve Martin actually in a um, romantic musical <laughs> drama <laughs> that I guess was a box office flop. But the, um, the, the director here directly quotes several Edward Hopper paintings from Nighthawks to New York movie. Sorry for the grainy picture there. <laughs> And then if any of you had a chance to see the Perry Mason updated version of Perry Mason on HBO this summer, I think a lot of that um, was inspired by kind of the film noir uh, um, uh, aesthetic. And then also, of course, Edward Hopper's painting. So you have Perry Mason over here on the right and then um, the Edward Hopper painting that's called Conference at Night, 1949. So this sense of people gathering in an office space in off hours to achieve maybe um, sort of unseemly goals. <laughs> All right, so our last section here, which I am probably the most excited about, so please hang on with me, is our section um, called Beyond Realism. So we've been thinking about Edward Hopper's paintings as direct depictions of the world around us. And this last, last section here is to sort of titillate our brains into thinking that really a lot of his pictures are responding to what's happening in the art world and integrating that in interesting ways. So we, we go back to Night Shadows from 1921, that etching on the right, and these kind of lonely scenes of empty cities are, is not something that Edward Hopper um, invented. In fact, we see the, the painting by the Italian artist Tatarico on the right from more than a decade earlier. And, and he was an artist who um, specialized in these kind of empty, abandoned cityscapes with these long shadows. Um, and these paintings are, are almost always categorized as surrealist paintings. They're, they're not meant to be factual depictions of, of the world around us, but there's that interest in, in the architecture and the isolation that comes along with it. Other ways that Edward Hopper, I think, is responding to the art world around him, I think really come out in a picture like this one that's called Chop Suey from 1929. And um, I, I feel like I sort of stumbled into this as I was looking at this picture, because when you look at it, your eye just goes to this beautiful woman in the tight green sweater who looks like she could be looking out at you. And then you just, you know, your brain just rests and relaxes, and you think, okay, it's a realistic picture. I can even see the chop suey sign just out the window. But what is going on? with this screen that is between, that's on the glass seemingly between the, um, the diners here and that sign. And I mean, take a look at that. That is a mess. <laughs> that is not the way that Edward Hopper paints a picture. We've got a little bit of green here. We can see the sign through this screen. It's a really strange element to this picture and it's right there practically at the center. And um, unless you spend a lot of time with this picture, it's hard to know what he's trying to achieve. My theory is that he's aware of um, non-objective painting that is happening around him and he's sort of trying to play with it. Um, this screen that he's painted here offers up the opportunity to create his own little Kandinsky <laughs> if you, if, or you know something like a Kandinsky on it. So the image on the right here is by um, 
is by the Russian painter Vasily Kandinsky from 1913. And he would make these images called improvisations, which I think Edward Hopper was essentially doing over here, where we can see elements that look recognizable. We can see it's sort of with this play of, of color and, um, and form and just kind of experimenting. And I think Edward Hopper was allowing himself to do that. So after I noticed that screen, I looked at the other window in this picture and I noticed that we have what seems like almost beams of light in what I would imagine would otherwise be an alley. And I think that the, that window in particular and what's happening out that window is probably Edward Hopper responding to another American artist, in this case, Charles de Muth and his iconic painting, My Egypt from just two years before Chop Suey was painting. Painted, And so we see that Charles de Muth is creating these beams of light, this uh, really sort of dynamic and, and fragmented um, vision of, you know, industri <laughs> industrial architecture in this case, that becomes invigorated by how he's, um, he's, he's just painted the space around it. In, in this really sort of dramatic and avant-garde way. And I think you get a little bit of a suggestion of that in a very, um, which would be a very non-Edward Hopper way to paint, but uh, maybe a little window allows him to, to practice that. And I think there's actually a lot of experimentation in the Nighthawks, so just bear with me. <laughs> one, of, one of the ways I see that in particular is with the door all the way over here on the right. Now there's so much about this painting that is painted in, um, in, 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 in a way that at least looks illusionistic, not necessarily like a window onto another world, but, um, but, but real enough that, that we know, you know, this is exactly a, stair, uh, a step into a, door, into a doorway. But this door to me, has always looked so incredibly flat. There's no door jam around it. There, it's just like a, a rectangle with a square in it. And to me, it, it seems like it's Edward Hopper sort of responding to the work of other artists at the time, artists like Paul Clay, who are just playing with color and form in a work like the one on the left, which is called Ancient Sound. And for Paul Clay, you don't need to be painting a story. You don't need to be painting um, anything in the natural world around us. You just need to be using, you know, these rough shapes and, and interesting colors together. And the palette here almost looks similar to, to what we see with, um, with Edward Hopper's painting. The other element, this is a stretch <laughs> from Nighthawks, which always, which always gets me, is those coffee pots and what's happening with the coffee pots there. You remember that was a, a big focus in his drawing of, of uh, in, in his preparatory work for this painting, but my eye goes to this drip between those coffee pots. And you can look at this picture in high resolution, uh, pull it up on Wikipedia, move and move it all around your computer screen, and there is not another drip in, in this picture. So this drip to me is very intentional and it's very avant-garde. It might be just the suggestion of coffee running out here, but it's also him playing with the, with the way he's applying paint to the canvas here. Now I'm not saying, that, um, that Edward Hopper uh, was doing drip paintings before Jackson Pollock, <laughs> but he is doing, he's, he is experimenting in interesting ways and allowing that drip to be there was an avant-garde move on his, on his part. So just a few more connections to modernism very quickly. Um, this is a picture from 1953, it's at the Met, it's called Office in a Small City. And this is a classic Hopper setup in that we are looking in a window <laughs> at a figure who's um, in an interior space. And then we can see out his window through this building. And, um, and along the right side, we see the architecture of this small city, these rounded windows and cornices. And then through this window, we see sort of a slightly different version of that same building where everything seems to be sort of flat and angular. And then beyond it, a really sort of modern 1950s looking building. 
And I think that Edward Hopper here might be playing with, um, with again, some of the color field paintings that were popular in the 1950s. And, um, and in particular, that modern building in the background really reminds me of Barnett Newman and his zipped paintings with the line going right through them. You can sort of see that in that modern building over here. So I, I think Edward Hopper finds these opportunities to create to um, these little um, modernist or avant-garde masterpieces within his realist paintings. And by the time we get to the last decade or so of his life, I think he has found, uh, he's really found ways to kind of boil down his painting. So we had Rooms by the Sea from 1951 that we saw before. And then the image on the right is called Sun in an Empty Room from 1963. So this is just a few years before he died. And we don't see um, any of the real kind of glorious detail that we see in Rooms by the Sea. Instead, it's really sort of this meditation on light, shadow, and form. And I think you could even boil it down to kind of the essence of painting here. So I've brought in um, a, a painting by Mark Rothko, another color field painter who actually credits Hopper with being an inspiration for him. And I think there's a really strong connection here between what they were doing. I mean, uh, if you look carefully, even the, the suggestion of nature outside that window is, is rendered so simplistically, it's that you can't even call it realism. So instead, I mean, what we're seeing here is really more akin to, to, the, to the modernist works that were happening in the 1960s at this time. All right, so to, to rein it all back in and to, to wrap it up for us here, we have Edward Hopper's legacy. Well, we know he and his wife had this really sort of, um, really sort of tough relationship and that he was kind of a cantankerous man. And we saw this kind of play out in his work. And then also, sorry, his some of his paintings. We, uh, I think that's why we get that overwhelming sense of, of loneliness. Um, and we have that idea of him being at his core, this young boy who doesn't want to work <laughs> against deadlines, um, who's really interested in capturing the reality of things in his drawings and then extrapolating that into his paintings. Well, he and Joe do stay together through the rest of their lives. Um, Hopper died in his studio at the age of 60, or in 1967 at the age of 50, 84. This is them um, at MoMA just a few years before that. Joe dies just 10 months later, and they're buried in his hometown of Nyack, New York. Before Joe dies, she bequeaths um, 3,000 works by um, Hopper, including drawings and that sort of thing, to the Whitney Museum. And a gift like that was unprecedented in the history of, of American art museums. She also gave the collection of, of her work, too, and believe it or not, as far as I know, this still holds true. The Whitney really only kept about three of her paintings and then put, uh, sort of re-gifted the rest of them to spaces where women wait and pass through. So you might find them in like hospital waiting rooms and that sort of thing around New York City. Um, Edward Hopper's reputation has been on the rise for quite some time, even before everybody starts reassessing his work in the age of coronavirus. Um, this painting here, Chop Suey, uh, was auctioned off for a record $91.9 million. Uh, every few years, one of his paintings comes up for sale at auction and, and essentially the price doubles. There's not a lot of them available. So, so, um, so clearly there's interest and, um, and his work is, is up there and it's selling with, um, with prices sort of akin to like Warhol and Hockney. So, um, so that about wraps up um, everything that we could cover tonight in terms of Edward Hopper. And we've seen sort of um, what has inspired him over the course of his career and maybe how he's kind of played with and responded to uh, uh, other things that were happening in the art world at this time. So thank you for um, bearing with me a little bit late tonight. And I welcome any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you so much, Jane. That was wonderful. And it, it just always feels like 
your presentations just feel like walking through an art museum these days with mm -hmm. uh, with a real expert who's kind of not only pointing out the ways that you you the history of the art that you're that's in front of you but also the ways to look at the art like i feel like i've learned so much over the course of uh of your series thank you so much my pleasure so the um so edward hopper is primarily at the whitney most of his works that's right okay are there any locally in boston Yes, so the MFA definitely has a has a good collection. There's that the bootleggers up in in Manchester, New Hampshire. I think most um, art museums that have any sort of American focus, they have to have like their one uh, Edward Hopper painting. <laughs> but I think for the most part, um, the 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 bulk of them are at the Whitney. Okay, I think I saw one a uh, couple maybe at the um, American the Smithsonian for American Art. Mm -hmm. and folk museum mm -hmm. i think that's what it's called um but uh but the the cape cod ones are really beautiful I oh, get they really are they really yeah. are so much light so yeah everyone's just saying like thank you so much for a wonderful lecture everyone really loved it um for anyone who's still online with us if you're on your way out um Will C says, I learned some new perspectives and a very interesting lecture. Thank you so much. Um, and if you're if you don't have any questions, uh, please join us next time on November. I just had it up here. It is Tuesday, November the 24th at 7 p.m. Um, when Jane will be covering heroes and homecomings, uh, Norman Rockwell and World War II, just in time for Thanksgiving. So that should be really, really nice, a really nice program for the holidays. Um, and we also have um, Vincent Van Gogh in December, which is going to be really excellent. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It's really Thank great. you so much, everyone. Someone said they loved the connection between Hopper and the other artists. I thought that was really neat too. I never thought about connecting about him being a bridge between the impressionists and the and the more contemporary artists. It's so fascinating to me too because it just seems like he's always just stood alone in his own right, and everybody just said he did what he did, and he, you know he was an independent artist who always seemed you know like he was never influenced by anybody else. But I think that's nearly impossible, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, don't artists, I mean, the, the, the motto is arts, artists steal, right? Um, that's for, I mean, borrow, I suppose is a better term for it. Um, and the connection with Hitchcock was interesting, too. I also um, thought that was interesting, his comment about uh, being, not wanting to be considered like Rockwell. Yes, I, he really tried to avoid creating paintings that had stories to them. Mm -hmm. He wanted everything to be ambiguous, and he wanted us to be able to fill in our own narrative there, which is really smart because I think that's what makes these pa paintings still so fascinating in so many ways. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Um, is the Addison Gallery had a painting in the 90s? Uh, I'm not sure if it's still there, but the Addison Gallery had a painting in the 90s. I, I, they have such a great collection. I, I can't think of offhand which hopper they have, but I'm almost positive it's still there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so we'll let you go, Jane. Thank you so much for your extra time tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And anyone who wants to sign up for the next lecture, check out our website. Um, if you go to our calendar, there's a registration form there. I will see you then. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you.